Okay. So, on the last class, there is one question coming from him. The question is that in order to calculate the Lyapunov of exponent, I say that you have to start from an initial condition and you have to evolve the trajectory and you take a perturbed position somewhere here say and let it evolve, but you cannot allow it to evolve for a long time because uh, in a chaotic system you expect the, the distances between two nearby points would increase but that cannot go on increasing indefinitely. So, in order to keep the whole thing bounded after some time this will fold. Folding means that if you are say taking the distance between these two points after some time it does increase say to this two points, but after some time it will fold like this. If it folds like this the distance between the two points will be seen to be decreasing which is a erroneous result because actually it has increased by this amount. So, in order to avoid that I said that you have to again renormalize it that means stop the process somewhere here and then come back in the direction of the deviation from here to here, but to the same extent of distance and then from here again start it. Okay. Again at this point you start stop it and you again come back to a distance. His question is after how long do we do this? obvious question yes. In in studying any any system you really do not know after how long it starts to fold right and this is normally done somewhat blindly that means you write a code and you allow it to work on the systems uh, equations. So, how do you decide essentially what we do is that we allow it to evolve for some time depending on the characteristic time of the system, any system has some kind of a characteristic time frame, some oscillate over a period of say milliseconds, some oscillate over a period of seconds, some oscillate over a period of even though the oscillation is a periodic, you can more or less identify the characteristic time okay. and this time should be somewhat of that order. Hmm. So, what we normally do is we set around that time and then we run it again by halving this time right. So, you make it half and then run it again. If you get the same result more or less then know that your estimate of the time is more or less okay. If not then you have to take the shorter time and do this procedure all over again that means you have to again make the time smaller and try to estimate the Lyapunov the exponent. If you find that it is now more or less close to the la last value, you know that you have arrived at the right one. That way it is done by somewhat like a trial and error method because for, for the full system you really do not know where uh, how much should be the characteristic time. In fact, a great deal has been written on this particular problem. There have been papers on this specific problem, how long should this be? And in the ready-made programs that are available, they, they home on to some kind of a uh, um, some kind of a algorithm to do that. For example, in a in a runge kutta type solution, uh, if you want to vary the step length, how should you vary? That has been a matter of great discussion for a long time. And now in MATLAB, you will find there is a code like OD23, OD45. Huh? What is it? It is first it first calculates by OD4, that means Runge Kutta fourth order, then it calculates by Runge Kutta fifth order. If it finds that the the there is a difference between the two results, then it knows that the step length has to be shortened. Okay. If they are more or less the same, then it allows the step length to be longer. Because if there is a sharp turn, it knows that a higher order uh, Runge Kutta method will give a more or less accurate result. So, if the lower order and the higher order yields a difference, it means that it is taking a sharp turn. So, in that case it has to take a short. So, there are therefore, different methods to, to uh, account for this kind of problems where you have to choose some kind of a step length. In general, it is done somewhat uh, in case of the Lyapunov exponent done by trial and error. You, you slowly reduce these times 
and find at what level it more or less converges to a number. Now you had a uh, question, this question was in the Lorentz system we find that at a particular parameter value probably it was 2 is it? Uh, or oh it, it was a different system. Huh? Okay. In general his question is that for some parameter value the two eigen values may become equal. So if they become equal then what? Now imagine it from a linear systems point of view meaning that you have suppose a linear system, two dimensional linear system so that I can draw a two dimensional linear system where you are changing a parameter and there are two real and distinct eigen, eigen values and eigenvectors. As you change the parameter they are coming to be the same and at some point of time they become equal and then after that what happens? They become comp complex conjugates. Something like if you plot the eigen values then it would traverse a path something like this that there is another coming. So as you change a parameter there is one coming this way, another coming this way and at some point they collide and then they go out like this, right? that is what normally happens. So when they are distinct, when they are distinct and on the negative side real and distinct then you know what the behavior is like, what is it like? There would be say two eigenvectors and you would find a behavior something like this. if they are real and distinct. Now when they come closer and closer what will happen is that these two eigen directions will come closer and closer and at some point they will merge right and after that it will develop after it goes to this side it will develop a spiraling behavior. When it becomes complex conjugate it will develop a spiraling behavior. Hmm. So just imagine the situation just before that you will have one eigen vector like this, another eigen vector very close to it, they are coming close to each other and after some time they will merge and the behavior will more or less be like this. So on and so forth, but soon after it will turn into a rotating behavior. Okay. So there has to be some way to visualize how this changes to this by very small change of the parameter, a very small change of the parameter from here to here huh, or from here to here, a very small change of the parameter should achieve this and as you know if you change a parameter by a small amount the resulting change in the vector field will also be by a small amount. So nothing drastic is happening really. Hmm. So what will be the behavior like? For that particular situation where you have one eigen vector and associated with it one eigen value okay. and it is a say converging eigen vector. Then the behavior will be on this it will have, have to convert if it is this side right. So it will converge like this. Note that it will not co come this way, while well, from here it will converge like this. Okay. Now do you see it is going into the spiraling behavior, a slight change you can visualize that it will go into the spiraling behavior and that is what happens the moment the two eigenvalues collide and go to the complex side it, it develops a spiraling behavior okay that means starts to starts to go like this so that situation is just a critical value between the two kinds of behavior where there is only one eigen vector associated with it only one eigen value but the behavior would be like this is that clear now Now 
we have so far seen two different systems mainly. We have seen the Lorentz system, we have seen the Rossler system and we have also seen the pendulum, right? this is the force pendulum system. And as you can easily imagine that there are a very large number of possible systems that go chaotic. Some you may even have seen in the in the melas. These days do you see some, some toys that uh, have a behavior that never repeats? Have you seen, seen, seen a toy something like this with two and in between there is a t and, and some fellow is uh, huh? and is touching and huh? everybody has seen, right? That is an, again a, a, a chaotic system because if you notice it carefully, you will find the same state is never repeating. Huh? So, these are very common really, it is not very uncommon systems and obviously they have to be common in electrical circuits also. Uh, so, today let me uh, give you a, a the circuit diagram of a very simple electrical circuit that gives this kind of a behavior. It consists of almost all of them are linear elements, just one nonlinear element. It is an inductor, a capacitor, oh, sorry, a capacitor, a resistor here, and a capacitor here. All these are linear elements, okay. And here there is only one nonlinear resistance to denote that it is a nonlinear element. So I have to give a uh, symbol for it. So this is a nonlinear element, nonlinear resistance. You can say. Hmm. So let's call this C1. Let's call this C2. Let's call this L. R and here there is a nonlinear resistance. So, this fellow is nonlinear. Obviously, in case it is nonlinear, then I have to specify what its characteristic is like. Its characteristic would be like this you have got the voltage across this and you have got the current through this. So, this is my V and this is my I. V is plus minus, then its behavior is something like this, a linear segment, another linear segment with the larger slope of the same is symmetrical. Okay. Here is symmetrical, here is the positive and negative sides are symmetrical with a larger slope and then you have got another segment which is like so. Okay. You can easily notice that this part is a negative resistance part and this part is a positive resistance part. So, if an orbit's behavior goes to this side, it will be dissipative. It is, if it is here, it should be expensive. So, it should ultimately result in some kind of a uh, periodic behavior. Or I mean, uh, it will normally not uh, behave like a just a uh, equilibrium point. So it's a it's a nice oscillator, you can, you can say. Now, its behavior would be that because of this RC uh, LC network, there would be an oscillation, and the power source for the whole circuit is only this because of the negative resistance part. So this has to have a power source character. Okay. So, its behavior would be that you see uh, you can either see a orbit like this or you can see an orbit like this. There are two very symmetrical parts and, and beyond a certain parameter they would tend to and finally, they will tend to go into that one. So, you will see a orbit something like this. The advantage of electrical circuit is that you can see that on the CRO screen and I would request most of you to, to actually do it on the uh, CRO screen. So, this is a VC1 versus VC2 
easily seeable uh, points. You might ask what this circuit consists of this nonlinear resistance. So, let me give you a diagram of the complete circuit. Here you have the inductor. If you want to make it, you will need this complete circuit diagram. Is it visible? Yes. This is 18 milli Henry. Here there is the capacitor. It is 100 <coughs> nanofarad. Here there is a resistance which is 10 K easily available components, there is no difficulty in making it. This fellow is 10 nanofarad. Okay. Now comes the, the nonlinear element that will have this property. It is actually realized by two op amps, op amp 1 and op amp 2. In the op amp 1, you have I will not spend much time on this circuit because we will talk about it after you have made it and seen the result. This is pin 3, pin 2, pin 1, and there will be a source plus 15 volt, and there will be another source minus 15 volt. Okay. This is pin 4, this is pin 11. Now, here this fellow also goes to this point. here and here from here there is a resistance going from here there is another resistance going here is again the plus 15 minus 15 pin 4 pin 11 here is pin 7 and here is 5 and 6 plus minus now these values are this is 22k can you read on the screen I given everything? I think so. So, all, all these components, okay, these two uh, op amps may be TL084 kind of uh, op amps. Okay. Now, those of you who are from electrical, instrumentation, energy, electronics, this will all make it on the breadboard, right. It is very easy to make, it takes not more than an, an hour or so to see the, the attractor on the CRO screen. All that you have to do is to put the CRO on the X, Y mode and to observe the attractor, fine. This is the variable <coughs> parameter where you connect a pot and as you change the pot, you should see the behavior changing from period 1 to period 2 to chaos and all that. Okay. It should go through a proper pathway to the chaotic behavior. 
So, the earlier things that I gave were meant mainly for simulation studies, this one is meant mainly for experimental studies, though if someone wants you can also simulate its equations you can also derive, but it should be like V C 1 that is one state variable, V C 2 another state variable and I to the inductor I L is another state variable. right? So, the equation should be in terms of this equal to now the first equation would be 1 by u m s jacket R c 1 V c 2 minus V c 1 minus 1 by c 1 this is the function functional form of the nonlinear register. Hmm. Here it is 1 by R c 2 V c 1 minus V c 2 plus I L here it is minus 1 by L V C 2. Okay. So, in order to explore the behavior of this circuit you might take one of the few possible avenues one which is most preferable do it experimentally two use these equations and simulate it three use P spice or some program like that to simulate the circuit. Okay, maybe simulink, whatever it is. But you may you may simply sim put this circuit diagram and uh, do the simulations. Huh? Any question? So one of the ways you should do it, depending on your background. If some of you are from electrical, electronics, computer instrumentation energy background you should actually do it experimentally for those who have who do not have the facility do it by simulations check the behavior okay and uh, report it tomorrow's class or tomorrow is a holiday so wednesday thursday we have a class spring fest oh so you have a lot of time to do it so <laughs> do it and uh, present it in the next class. Hmm. Tell us the behavior, fine. So, the, the purpose of the whole exercise was to give you the feel that there are in fact a large number of systems in this uh, nature, where this kind of behaviors are quite natural. Hmm. Also in engineering there are very large number of systems, where this kind of behaviors are quite natural. But I cannot really keep on multiplying examples. Hmm. At some point of time, we have to stop and talk about the theory. So, in order to just give you a feel, let me tell you that all switching circuits are nonlinear circuits because there is a switch, switch is a nonlinear thing. The whole area of power electronics, therefore, is a hotbed of this kind of nonlinear phenomena any system that has this kind of nonlinearity will have and, and as we have already I have already told you that for example any system where there is a limit cycle hard limit cycle right and therefore if there is a limit cycle you know that the system is not linear you cannot have a limit cycle in a linear system so in order to hard in order for the hard to function it is also a nonlinear system and of course if you if, if you are dealing with a nonlinear system you can be you can uh, expect this kind of behavior and in fact that happens. People have really done data acquisition on the human heart, found what happens when it goes into those irregular oscillatory motions, what happens just before the system collapses. So, all that different types of diseases have been analyzed from nonlinear dynamics point of view. Remember people have estimated eigenvalues of heart, people, people's heart. Okay. So, if your heart is very healthy, your eigenvalue should be you know that part I have not taught out therefore, I am not uh, I am not dealing with that today, but you know that it can be is st st stability can be estimated from eigenvalues. The solar system itself is unstable do you know uh, solar system itself is, is unstable system. Uh, 
in fact it looks very stable right it, it comes back huh? but of course in a unstable system you still have the characteristic time or if you talk about the Lyapunov exponent we have said that the time after which the the prediction will fail depends on the extent of divergence huh? so extent of nonlinearity extent of instability that will ultimately talk about the the extent of time for which predictions will be valid and we know that for our purpose all our predictions about the motion of the planets have, be, have been reasonably successful but still the system is unstable in fact towards the turn of the century there was a a uh, what should i say not a competition but the king of sweden i think he entered he he announced a award for somebody who can prove that it is stable hmm? because he was interested in, in in really proving mathematically that the solar system is stable and many entries came of course and finally the person who won the prize was henry poincare hmm? poincare was a great mathematician theorist theorist you can say probably you heard his name in other contexts also but before he got the prize he retracted the paper saying that i found an error and then where he found an error i'll come to that later but he essentially found an error that proves that it should be unstable and in fact that is now accepted knowledge yes it cannot be stable hmm? in fact we do even use the instability of the system or you can say the sensitive dependence on initial condition hmm? but the, those who are, those of you who have done a physics course on say classical mechanics know that any three body system is heard of the three body system problem huh? if there are two bodies then it their, their motions is at, would, would be around each other Mm, and you can easily write down the equation solve it and you can find out the behavior if there are three bodies then you cannot do so you can still write down the equation but you cannot solve them and it has been a long standing problem now it is realized that the moment there are three bodies the system equations become uh, chaotic behavior and that is why its it, its behavior is such that you cannot really do the prediction now often we do use it for fruitful purposes for example uh, around 1987 or 88 i forget, forget around that time there was a uh, comet coming and scientists wanted to have a look at it now you cannot really launch a a, a, a a spacecraft aiming at a particular comet why because the comets suddenly come and you do not have the time to make this space, this spacecraft okay so there was a comet coming and these guys wanted to take a look at it very careful look at it so how to do that they realize that they already have some uh, satellites artificial satellites circling the the earth and they could be used provided they can be hauled to the certain distance but the difficulty is that none of the satellites have that much of fuel because satellites use fuel only to to keep it in track keep it in the in the particular orbit so small amount of nudge it only gives so there was a satellite that was almost nearing its uh, lifetime it had a remainder amount of fuel available and the scientists decided to use that to observe that comet but the comet was then close to jupiter so you can understand what distance it had to travel and there was no fuel it so happens that the the earth jupiter and the satellite is a three body system and therefore it is a it is a it can easily be calculated to be a chaotic system there should be a sensitive dependence on initial condition so if you nudge the system's initial condition slightly there should be a large deviation in the final condition hmm? they manage to calculate and then use that small amount of residual fuel to nudge it to that position say that initial condition so that the gravitational attraction of these three bodies i mean it is basically a gravitational problem that itself properly to the vicinity of that uh, uh, comet and they took a photograph so this way we do used even the the instability that is there in the in the uh, solar system but the point is that there is another very compelling reason why chaos should be very <coughs> common in nature 
the compelling reason is this that if if say every system in the in the in the in the world are non chaotic what does it mean it means that if you observe the initial condition with some error ball you can evolve it and predict the final condition so the final condition is exactly given by the initial condition right final state is given by the initial state if everything has that property that the final state is given by the initial state then one might easily say that what we are doing today talking about it the the molecules and atoms in your body they are moving inside your body making you think in a particular way listening to my lecture and all that that were preordained by things that happened for 100 years back right but that's obviously not true so there must be some way for new information to be created and whenever you it's not possible to predict even theoretically that's why the new information be, is being created right so since you can see that this preordained thing is is evidently uh, false therefore it immediately comes to the uh, conclusion that uh, much of the system that we see in nature must have that property that there must be sensitive dependence on initial condition is that clear so what we are talking in this course is not really the oddity hmm. you might have a feeling that the chaos thing is somewhat odd i mean we don't really come across that kind of things but not quite so not quite so it's, it's quite common nonlinearity is also very common these things are also very common and if you do not take the nonlinearity into account uh, what happens i may have a couple of pictures to show you that bridge we may run it all over again to see so this is what a bridge is doing a bridge that was designed depending on linear system theory so uh, if you take nonlinear into account then that could have been uh, predicted so if that happens this, this, that was the tacoma bridge just before its collapse and it it collapsed after some months of operating and while it operated it operated like that you know well, whenever there was a strong wind it it had both the directions of oscillation this direction and that, that direction and both were uh, photographed and on the net if you search for the tacoma bridge collapse you will find stories of people who were actually on the bridge in a car when it collapsed uh, so you will find those things that is what happens if you do not take nonlinearities into account and design your systems based on linear system theory okay so having established the, the necessity of understanding this now we set on the task of understanding the tools by which we will try to understand this kind of behaviors oh before that uh, let me let me just show in brief what are the different types of behaviors of a system that we have heard of one a simple equilibrium point where everything collapses in the state space hmm? two a closed loop that is a limit cycle three a high periodic limit cycle four a chaotic behavior huh? where the same state never repeats there is a fifth type which i will mentioned in passing today and we will take it up in greater details later but since we are now uh, uh, I, I, I am putting my cards on the table one after the other the things that will will come in the in the subsequent lectures you have to understand what is coming so there is another type of behavior which is also very common where the dynamics happens in the state space happens on the surface of a torus so the torus a donut 
Okay. Imagine the dynamics happening on the surface of a torus, it would be and so on and so forth, it will wind around. Okay. And these things are also reasonably common. It is not difficult to see that there is one frequency along this direction, there is another frequency along this direction. So, it is actually a combination of two frequencies. Such a behavior, if you subject it to a Fourier analysis, you will find the two peaks. Hmm? There are two distinct frequency components. All right. Now, you may say that is that repetitive? Is that a periodic waveform? Well, may or may not be. If the same state after having come uh, all through, if it if it merges with this one, then you would say that it is a periodic orbit. But if it does not, then you would not say that. Now, can you see under what condition it would and under what condition it would not? There is a frequency associated with this one, there is a frequency associated with this one, there is a time associated with this one, there is a time associated with this one. If these are incommensurate, that means there is this no number uh, that can be obtained by multiplying this one by some number, that one by some number, number means natural number then these are incommensurate. If they are incommensurate, the same state never comes to act to itself. It will wind go on winding around, but it will not fall on the same position exactly. Hmm. Therefore, the orbit will be aperiodic, still aperiodic, okay. but it will not have the sensitive dependence on initial condition. Hmm. So, there is also possible another type of orbit, this type of orbit where there is no sensitive dependence on initial condition, but the orbit is aperiodic. If you start from two nearby initial conditions, they will always keep the same distance. If they always keep the same, same, same distance, what is the Lyapunov exponent? Lyapunov exponent is what? On an average, e to the power lambda t times the initial distance. right? What should be lambda so that the, the initial distance keeps itself? No, zero. Right, zero. So, in such systems, the Lyapunov exponent is zero. In fact, whether or not the, the dynamics is actually happening on the surface of a torus, that can be simply estimated by estimating the Lyapunov exponent. If you find it to be zero, it is happening on the torus. Hmm. Such behaviors. Uh, that means dynamics on torus can be of two types. One, if the two frequencies are incommensurate, then the same state never repeats, and this behavior is called quasi periodicity. However, if they are commensurate, they are commensurate, then what happens? Then the same state comes and, and re repeats itself, so that it will become actually periodic orbit. Okay. It is actually periodic orbit, where these two frequencies are sort of locked. And you will find that this kind of behavior is also not very uncommon though. Huh? So, that is called a mode locked periodic orbit. The two frequencies are locked. And in such systems, even if you part away parameter by slight amount, the locking still continues. That is why it is locked. It is not that if you there are two frequencies, you, you try to change one frequency, it will, it will no longer remain uh, incommensurate. No, it is not so. They get locked and they remain locked for some time. And one of the very uh, clear examples is the, is the motion of the moon around the earth. How does the, the moon move around the earth? There is one motion of the moon around the earth itself and there is also the motion of the moon around its own axis. There are two things, two frequencies really and these two frequency components are commensurate. Hmm. The two frequency components are commensurate with, with, with ratio of 1 and that is why what happens? You see only one face of the moon. Hmm. So, the, the speed at which the uh, the moon is going around the earth at the same speed it is going around its own axis. 
and you might ask how did this happen? Uh, is, is, is it just a stroke of luck that it happened? No, it is not. There is a very well understood nonlinear phenomenon going behind it which makes it locked. And you will find that out of the hundreds of satellites that are there in the solar system, most are such mode locked, hmm? but not at that 1 is to 1 frequency rate. There may be other frequency, but most are mode locked. So, this is another component. In order to understand the, the type of behavior, again you can, you can imagine the type of behavior, I mean there are two frequencies as the motion of the moon around the sun. Now, we are not considering the, the axial rotation, but motion of the moon around the sun. The earth is rotating around the sun and the moon is rotating around the earth. Now, if I ask you what is the rotation of the moon around the sun, it is a motion on, on a torus. So, this way you can easily figure out that this is not very uncommon, these are reasonably common things. Okay. But here we are talking about the torus in the state space. So, in the state space a torus is occurring and you see the, the state motion on this in the state space as the motion on the torus, that is quasi periodicity. Okay. So, here is the complete picture. This is all that can happen as stable behavior of a dynamical system. Unstable behavior, transient behavior, there can be many other things. But stable behavior, there can be only these types. Therefore, there are two questions that would automatically come to one's mind. One, seeing a system's behavior or say an experiment is running, a system is running where we have implanted some kind of a measuring instrument, some instrumentation is done, we are getting the data. By analyzing the, the data, how can we infer which type is it? Quite natural question in experimental situation. If say a situation system changes from one type to the other as you change a parameter, how can we predict that and also how can we understand that? There must be a theory behind it, theory behind such changes, we will deal with that in the, in the in this course. So, there are, would be naturally similar such questions whenever we talk about, for example, how does this kind of a uh, behavior come into being, how does it happen. So, if I simply say that it happens, that is not a good answer, it has to be some theoretically grounded that it changes from one type to this by some very well understood mathematical mechanism. But ultimately, much of control theory centers around our understanding of stability, right. Those who, those of you who have done some course on control theory know that half the control theory course is essentially treatment of stability. We are trying to understand the stability of systems. And in control theory, what kind of systems? Uh, are those whose stability are we inquiring? Essentially, we are inquiring the stability of equilibrium points. In nonlinear systems, we have first time encountered the possibility of a limit cycle, and we have also understood that these limit cycles are very common in engineering as well as very common in nature also. And therefore, we have to be worried about the, the stability of the limit cycles also, right. Oscillator, for example, you design an oscillator, you are interested in its, its stability. So, how do you infer its stability? Obviously, its stability is not the same as this fellow stability. In case of a simple equilibrium point, the stability you knew can be assessed simply by obtaining the Jacobian around it, obtaining the eigenvalues, and if the eigenvalues are in the left half plane, it is stable. Simple stuff. Obviously, the stability of a limit cycle cannot be inferred that way because it goes through various points. It is not just one point. It goes through a full, uh, uh, a wider range of the state space, and through that wider range, the behavior is not the same. It is it is a nonlinear system. So at this point, if you locally linearize, at this point if you locally linearize, at this point if you locally linearize, they will not in the same thing. So if you locally linearize at every point, you would see that the matrix elements are changing as it goes through. Obviously, it is a non-trivial problem, how to assess the stability of this. Okay. Similarly, a high periodic orbit 
is stability can also be a question stability of chaotic orbits what is what do you mean by the stability of chaotic orbit well chaotic orbit it itself is the, the result of instability hmm. at every point on the chaotic orbit the thing is unstable but it's not going around go, going to infinity the chaotic orbit stability would be understood as when states run to infinity hmm. that means its boundedness is no longer satisfied then it becomes unstable so we would also need to understand under what condition a chaotic orbit can become unstable we will also need to understand under what condition can the torus orbit also become unstable now before we end this class i will give you a glimpse of the method and we will elaborate upon it in the next class so our problem let us start with this problem we have got in the three dimensional space we have got an orbit which is a closed loop and i want to find out its stability the essential method was developed by same man henry poincare hmm. his method was something like this he said the suppose imagine an imaginary plane a section that intersects the the uh, orbit an imaginary section in the state space that intersects the orbit which means that the orbit will pierce its section and will go to the other side so uh, the orbit will say it, it it will go like this and at this point it will pierce the section okay now if it is stable orbit if it is stable orbit if you part of it what will happen the 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 perturbation will die down hmm. as a result of which if you start from a different po point on the suppose the starting point is on this plane suppose you started from here that means you can also imagine it as this orbit having been perturbed to this point what will happen it will come but after all since it is coming closer and closer to the this thing it will come somewhere here closer and then it will again go and it will come to again at some some point that is closer so on this plane you would see you not not a straight line you would see a succession of points that ultimately convert onto this this point therefore the the issue of this the continuous time orbit has now been brought down to the lev level of what is known as a map that means this point is mapping to this point this point is mapping to this point that point will again map to this point so that a point forget about the whole whole evolution just look at what is happening on this plane a point is mapping to a point is mapping to a point is mapping to a point and so on and so forth you get a sequence of points and if that sequence is a convergent sequence you know that the limit cycle is stable okay this section is called the poincare section this section is called a poincare section so poincare invented this method of reducing a continuous time evolution into a map here is a discrete time dynamic system see on this poincare plane it is a discrete time dynamic system discretely it jumps from a point to another point it doesn't move continuously okay it jumps from a point to point and you get a sequence of points and that should be convergent now you might say that on this poincare plane 
though the original thing was x, y, z, there was three, three coordinates. On this plane, there are only two coordinates. So, you have brought down the system's complexity by one degree. Hmm? The system dimension has been brought down by one degree, that is one advantage. The other advantage is that a system of differential equations, that means the original thing was expressed in this form x dot is equal to f x, these are all vectors. But now here, it has now become what? It has now become on this plane, it would be x n plus 1, n plus 1th instant the position is a function of x n. It is a discrete time dynamical system and discrete time dynamical systems are far easier to handle than continuous time uh, differential equations. Hmm. That is why uh, this has actually triggered, that means this method is almost universally used in order to estimate the stability of any uh, periodic orbit or this kind of orbit, that is not a just a equilibrium point. So, this method essentially achieves this, that this set of differential equations has been changed to this, but there is a one to one correspondence really, because here there is a the, there is a particular uh, difference equation or a uh, discrete time dynamical system or a map it's also called a map and as i told you that this is also called a flow the set of differential equations is also called a flow because it 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 sets into 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 action a vector field that looks like a flow so this is a flow to a map. So, Poincare section achieves the transformation from flow to a map. Now, if you know the map, you can infer the, the orbits and then there is a one to one correspondence between the behavior of the map and the behavior of the dynamical system, actual continuous time dynamical system. Okay. So, there is a one to one relationship which means that a periodic orbit as seen as a peri stable periodic orbit in a map will be a stable periodic orbit in the continuous time dynamical system also. What is a stable periodic orbit in a map? A map, a stable orbit means, stable point means, in that case this point will be stable, which means a point which maps to the same point. In other words, x n plus 1 is equal to uh, x n. Okay. So, this was actually f x n, if it that happens to become a equal to x n, that is the point, that is the equilibrium point and that will be related to the comp the limit cycle in the continuous time. Okay. And you can now reduce the problem that was looking enormously complicated because on the, the, the complete cycle at every point that was a different type of nonlinearity and it, it becomes hellish to study the stability, but now you can reduce the problem to another linear problem. I can look at the local linear neighborhood of this map and study the stability of this fixed point in the same way as we studied the stability of equilibrium point. Right. So, the whole problem again becomes essentially the study of stability in the linear stability uh, consideration. We will develop on this issue in the next class. That's all for today.